Hey, what's up, guys? Welcome to another episode of Crosscut Creators. I'm your host, Aaron, and I am super happy to bring you one of the coolest creators I have ever had the pleasure of meeting. His name is Kyle T. Webster. He is the top Photoshop brush creator in the world. He has built over 2,000 Photoshop brushes, and I'm talking about brushes that have been used at DreamWorks, Weta, Disney, Pixar, you name it. He is an internationally award-winning illustrator. This guy's work has been seen in Time Magazine, The New Yorker, Utney, New York Times, LA Times, USA Today. I mean, every single magazine, every single newspaper you've probably ever heard of or picked up, you've seen Kyle's work in it. If this is your first time to the channel, please hit that like button if you like what you see. If you want to see more of it, hit the subscribe button. So without further ado, here's Kyle. Kyle, my friend, man, Kyle T. Webster is in the house, ladies and gentlemen. Hey. We got, we got an illustrator, published author. Let me see if I can get this all straight in one go. University instructor. Yeah. Is that right? <laughs> app inventor. I think you've done two apps, right? You did plates and uh, white lines. I actually did six apps, but only Jesus. two of them. Two of them were for myself <laughs> and the other four were for clients. <laughs> wow. Okay. So iOS app inventor, magician, musician. Salsa dancer, public speaker, father of two, entrepreneur, Photoshop brush maker. I, I think I think I'm, I've lost track on my fingers. I mean, I have some toes. Is there, are there any more endeavors that you would uh, like to add to your credit roll? No, I, I can't think of any right now. Maybe there's some other stuff. I'd like to bounce around a lot. <laughs> I, I, I I could see that. I think that's going to be a theme of our of our discussion today. Uh, I think it's it's all driven by fear, man. That's just like you know, <laughs> fear, fear of. Fear of things not working out forever, so you have to change gears. I, I, a lot of times that was what kind of drove me to try something new was a feeling like, well, I, I can't keep doing this forever. People are going to get tired of it, or it's just there's no way this can last, so I have to do something new. And I don't know if that's uh, something that a lot of people who are makers of some kind, uh, freelancers of some kind, have in common, which is this fear that when things are going well, there's no way you can sustain that, and it's probably just you got lucky and it's short short term success. So you got to find the next great thing. So I think a lot of the time that was what was making me do all those different things or try to at least be good at several things. So I hasn't been to fall back on. <laughs> wow. That is not what I expect you to say. I was, I'm really interested. I wanted to pick your brain about that and understand mm -hmm. sort of your, the mentality there. I had assumed that it was, you know, you, it is like some level of uh, boredom. Like you would, you know, say, you know, I oh, can sure. only take salsa dancing so much. So I'm going to have to go <laughs> learn some magic tricks or uh, no, boredom yeah. plays into it in a really interesting way too. Um, well, there's a lot of stuff. There's there's being excited about a lot of things, which just comes from as a kid being excited about a lot of things. So you know how when you're a kid, you like you know someone introduces you to a new idea or a new game, um, some new uh, activity of some kind. You're all in for like a couple of minutes or a couple of days. And it's the new thing. Uh, so some of those just caught for me a little little harder and I would ride them longer and then get excited about them and just get some skills in some areas. So, I mean, music was part of the family. So that's just one of those things where I couldn't escape it. And so that's also, I think a huge part of it is what's your environment when you grow up. Both my parents play instruments and were musicians. So, you know, music was always on in the house anyway, in the background. So that that's kind of an impossible thing to escape. So of course I started playing music, um, but things like, you know, you mentioned card magic or, some other things I, I like to do are origami. Um, I got interested in things like uh, Tai Chi, <laughs> which is just basically like martial arts slowed down. I got excited about that. Um, uh, and that was part of my environment because I grew up overseas. And when I was in Singapore and in Taiwan, I would see people doing Tai Chi when I walked to school. So it's one of those things you see it enough, you get excited about it or interested or curious about it. So you then try it yourself. So. Um, so it's not just fear. Fear came later with the business side, like taking all those exciting things that I was interested in and trying to roll them into some kind of money making venture. Um, you know, that I think that was the connection there. But but as far as just having interest in lots of things, um, speaking of boredom, I, I actually gave a, a talk at Lincoln Center three years ago about the importance of boredom in the creative process. Yeah, I saw that. It's freaking oh, amazing, man. Thanks. Yeah, tell us about it. 
Yeah. So I think while it's one of the hardest things right now is to be bored. Um, we have, you know, basically encyclopedias in our pockets. They're much better than encyclopedias. They have video and <laughs> and everything else. But, um, you know, you really don't have the option to be bored uh, because it's too easy to just pull out your phone and watch a video or whatever. Um, but uh, I don't think it's really that easy to be truly creative, especially in an inventive way. Uh, if you want to be an innovator, um, if you're constantly consuming media, you're not giving your chance, uh, your brain a chance to get bored, like well and truly bored, where you start spacing out and then you start telling stories to yourself or coming up with ideas because um, your brain doesn't want to be bored. It's always craving stimulation, right? Mm. But if you don't give it any, it's going to start creating its own. And um, this used to be a normal thing for people when, you know, you go to the, the DMV or something like that 30 years ago and you didn't have a phone and you didn't bring a book and maybe you didn't have a hobby like sketching in a sketchbook. You would just sit there and zone out and eventually you'd be daydreaming. Daydreaming is a thing that I don't think the majority of the population even does anymore. Yeah. Um, I really don't think it's, it's a thing. You could probably in 20 years, if you tell somebody you were daydreaming, they won't even know what you're talking about because is that, that an activity. App? Is that an app? Is it called daydreaming? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey, hold on to that idea because I think we can make something. Oh, God, no. See? We can't kill the daydream. No. Uh, anyway. <laughs> But that's, you know, that's, I mean, I think you people should try it more. Um, and I'm excited about that, too, because of meditation. And I recently mm. got into that, you know, recently, I say within the last 10 years. But um, but more and more, just really seeing the benefits of that and, and uh, how that ties into the creative process as well. So. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And for those who have not watched that video, I will put it into the, a link in the description. It is fantastic. It is like every bit as high quality as a TED Talk. Kyle is amazing. Thank you. I uh, highly recommend watching that. It's about 20, 25 minutes. It's, it's great. It's great, great watch. So uh, l let's talk about, you know, sort of of all these things that you've been interested in, of all these things you've done. It seems to me from where I stand that your most consistent, hardcore passion has been illustration. Oh, yeah, 100%. Every time I talk to you, every time I walk into your house, every time I've ever been a part of anything you've done, it's it's you're either doing a caricature or you're, you're, <laughs> you're drawing a naked person somewhere in some place or in a coffee shop or, you know, where you, you're, you're, you're now you're building these, these digital brushes that the illustrators all over the world are using for incredible works of art. Um, tell us a little bit more about your, your illustration career. I, I mean, I, I like people to understand sort of just that thin slice is, <laughs> When I say thin, it's it's an incredible <laughs> portion of your career. But amongst yeah. all the other shiny objects, talk to us about your illustration work. Um, yeah, and I think and so it's different for every person. So illustration is one of those weird um, career paths that people get into it from different in different ways, and everyone's got a different story to tell. Mine, mine is I was a fine art major, and uh, that was just wonderful because I was in the studio painting and drawing. The thing is, I didn't know how to translate that into a career. So last semester of school, I, I learned HTML. So when I graduated, I had a little web design job. And um, that's I stuck with that for uh, three years. And then I got laid off, which was a huge blessing in disguise. Because during every meeting, uh, when I was at my web design job, I was always drawing. So I wasn't listening to anything. I was just drawing Batman, drawing whatever. And... Um, I realized uh, when I got laid off that I, I, I didn't want to go back to web design. I wanted to figure out how to draw more. And I knew at, at this time because, and this was the, the fortunate thing for me, and this is different for everybody, you have to have exposure to stuff. And when I was a fine art major in school, I was not exposed to the world of commercial art. Um, I was doing drawing and painting for the sake of, you know, getting better at it, but not, not with illustration in mind as a career. And um, I didn't even realize that was an option, to be honest, uh, which might be surprising to some folks now. But I mean, we're talking, this is 1994, 95, 96, you know, um, the Internet wasn't yet shoving images down our faces. Right. Uh, like now we have Instagram and it's it, we're just everything's image based. You Everyone's aware mm. that illustration exists because you just see it everywhere. Um, so 
I, I, I didn't know what to do with it, but I knew I liked to draw. And I was working at a place that had an ad agency attached to it. So because the web design company was part of the ad agency, I was exposed to this work relationship that art directors had with illustrators. And I sort of got a little bit of that. I understood a little bit of that. So I created a fake portfolio. And I think this is so important for young people or anybody who's an aspiring anything to know about, which is this, this concept of, I mean, people say fake it till you make it. But my example of faking it till you make it is I made a fake portfolio of work where I had done work supposedly for Nike and all these other big brands. Mm -hmm. And I, I made fake posters and like things like that. And I put that all together and I started shopping it around design firms in the area and ad agencies. And after three months, um, I would gotten a few little freelance jobs enough to sustain me during that time when I was looking for a job. And I got hired part-time at a design agency uh, to sort of be like an in-house illustrator on a project that was going to take a month. And at night, what I had been doing was sending my work to these really tiny little publications, some of which don't exist anymore. They're called alternative news weeklies. Hmm. These used to be free newspapers you could get in cities all across the country. In San Francisco, they still have it. San Francisco Weekly, LA Weekly, Seattle Weekly. It's part of the Village Voice network of, of papers. Um, and Village Voice became a media company and they had, they owned like 30 or yeah. 40 of these all around the country. And at that time, lucky for me, when I got in a good relationship with one art director at one of those, they would pass my name around. And then, so when I was working as a designer, I would have like five or six illustration jobs per week for these little alt weeklies, each paying about $150, $200 a pop. So I was supplementing my income with like four or $5,000 sometimes a month. If I got really lucky, I'm really busy, especially if I got a cover, those paid $700. Mm -hmm. um, so at night I'd be doing that. And then during the day, and I was, it was burning myself out. I was exhausted. So I just said, I'm going to quit my job and try and make a full-time illustration job work. And the key moment for me was my own boss. Um, before I started working as a, with these freelance jobs, um, showed me a Society of Illustrators annual publication. And what it is, is every year they select the best illustrations, so to speak, um, of the year from editorial category, book category, advertising, et cetera. And they put them in a book. And he had a few of these. He showed me one. And I was like, that's what I want to do. I, forget all this other stuff. I just want to draw and do good illustrations and get paid for it. And so I drew a picture of Jack Black right after I had seen a, he had been, he came to Winston Salem where I live and did a concert with Tenacious D. Mm -hmm. And I was like, that guy's so fun. And I, I drew him and I sent it as a submission, uncommissioned category to the Society of Illustrators. And I actually got in the book. So they have this gala event in New York at the museum there, the Museum of American Illustration. I went up there and I met this guy, John Hendricks, who was an illustrator. And he's so kind and so friendly, still a buddy of mine now. He let me come and see his studio the next day before I flew home. And like, I was just in love with this whole idea of sitting in a, a space without an employer yeah. <laughs> telling you what to do and just drawing pictures and like just making doing making what you work. love. Just doing what you love. Yeah. So I did that. I, I quit and I, I just slowly, slowly made my way up the ladder with bigger publications. And we can, I don't know if your audience would care to know the ins and outs of that because it's, it's pretty intricate. Well, I but, think um, they would love to know at least some of the, the, you know, I mean, you were doing these sort of indie publication pieces for a long time, but then, I mean, that wasn't the end of your illustration no. career by any chance. I mean, by any stretch of the imagination, just, just who are some of the bigger clients that you've done illustration work for? I had regular jobs for a while with the New Yorker. I would do stuff for New York times. I did time magazine, uh, the Atlantic, um, wow. all the major newspapers, you know, uh, LA times and wall street journal and uh, USA today. And, uh, just really all of them. I, I can't think of a magazine. I didn't, the only one I didn't work for that I wanted to work for was Rolling Stone. I never got a chance to oh, work wow. with them. Um, still but, time. Uh, yeah. I don't know. Uh, I did Wired. Um, yeah, because, and the way I did it, and this is, I think this is a, an important lesson for folks out there, just is this idea of putting yourself out there and, uh, with no fear when, it, when there's no risk involved. I think, you know, a lot of times you have to look and say, what's the risk? And if there's really no risk other than pride, um, you really need to just swallow that pride and go for it. So, um, or, you know, pride's maybe not the only one there, there, but if you look at it and say, there's no risk here financially, there's no risk, whatever. Um, I take calculated risks and I wanted to work for, for example, entertainment weekly, mm -hmm. uh, which, you know, at the time was a big magazine and they had a great budget. 
And instead of getting paid 150 or 200 dollars for a little portrait, I knew I could get like 800 dollars for a portrait. So same amount of time, same effort, same work, four times the the pay, paycheck. So I, um, what I did was I called the basically the front desk of Entertainment Weekly's offices, and I knew a receptionist would answer. And I was thinking to myself, what what matters to this receptionist? Um, basically, they're there, happy to answer the phones, happy to transfer you to whoever, and then they want their lunch and they want to go home. It's not like <laughs> they're deeply invested in the success of the magazine. Or anything like that. So I simply called and said, I knew the art director's name. I said, hey, uh, my name's Kyle Webster. i sorry, I just got cut off with so-and-so. Can you please reconnect me? <laughs> and she was like, yeah, awesome. of course. And she just did it. So that was how I got in touch with, his name is Eric Paul. He's a wonderful guy. And so I got in touch with him. <laughs> I, and he picked up the phone because, of course, it's coming through. And he figures, well, if the receptionist is putting it through, it must be you know, this is legit. Important. Yeah. <laughs> so he, he picks it up and I go, Hey, I don't, Eric, you don't know me. I know I'm just going to take 10 seconds of your time. Um, I want to, I, I want to, I'm really good at portraits, but here's my email. Here's my website address or whatever. I said something like that. And, um, he's like, uh, hang on, stay on the phone. And then he went to my website while we're on the phone. He's like, Oh, nice. He said, guess what? I just had four portraits come in for a special. Another artist dropped out. I need these in two days. Can you do them? I was like, yeah, awesome. And there were $800, $800 a pop. And they were only like quarter page, you know? Yeah. So I made like $3,200 in two days on that job. And then I had an Entertainment Weekly connection. He was happy. I saved his butt because, you know, things went well. He was able to make his deadline. Um, and through that, then I did that several times. You know, I would call just blind, hmm. call these places. And uh, cold calling is what they, I don't know if people still use that term. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so I yeah. think that's one of the things is like, uh, if you, if there's an obstacle of some kind, there's like a sort of like a gatekeeping situation that you're facing. Um, you try and find a side door and you can, you can, if you're, if you think about it long enough, you're usually going to be able to figure that out. You can get sneaky and you can figure it out. And it's not sneaky in a way that's like deviant or anything. Yeah. It's, it's, no, it's, it's fine. It's, I think of that as like a, the the positive hustle, right? Like you always are hustling, trying to, and people want those people. I, you know, if I'm, if I'm the, the, the editorial director of a, a major publication, I, you know, I want people that are innovative and creative and, and don't just, you know, come to me with problems. They come to me with solutions and, yeah you know, they figure stuff out and they find a way to get what they want. And if you can do that in an ethical way, then I, I think that's killer, especially when you're scrapping, you're young and you just need yeah. to get a, get hooks in, in order to to build an amazing career like you have, what would you say just knowing what you figured out throughout your career to, to tell somebody to do um, specifically with like social media, like how would they leverage that? So that's a really, that's a tricky question. Um, I find with social media, it's much harder, much harder to make a true human connection than the sound of your voice. Uh, like a phone call was very beneficial to me because I could through my voice, very quickly read another person. Um, you can with just you when you're having a conversation with somebody, even if, if you can't see their face, but if you just hear their voice, you can hear urgency, you can hear impatience, you can hear happiness, you can hear all these different things that can then um, guide you so that you know how to keep the conversation going and make that other person feel engaged and yeah. um, interested and so on. So um, that really worked in my favor. I, I built, I mean, I built l legit friendships with, um, art directors who I'd never met in person who would call me for a job. There's a guy, Pete Morelowicz, who, uh, over the course of about seven or eight years moved from being a small art director at Washington city paper, which is a tiny alternative news weekly to then, um, USA today, huge change. And then became design director for a suite of magazines, like 10 different magazines. Wow. And I stuck with him that whole way. And so his ascension, you know, to this higher role, I got to be part of that ride and, and I got to benefit from it. And we both, it was mutually beneficial because, you know, he always had an artist to call for various things. And I had 
work, but it was also um, the reason he called me more than anything was we loved to just chat. So he would call me with a job and we'd talk about it for five minutes and then we'd spend 20 minutes more just catching up and laughing. That's great. So that is very difficult to do through social if you're only communicating through text, um, mm-hmm. which is predominantly what, what we use, even if it's Twitter, which is more of the sort of uh, social uh, network, I guess, where conversations happen. Most of them, though, are pretty toxic, but depends on where you're, where you're hanging out on Twitter. Um, I would say Facebook is really kind of out of the picture at this point for that kind of stuff. Um, with Instagram, because you're communicating with images, People can leave comments on the images, but it's not really the same thing. And then when people do a live broadcast, I I wouldn't say you're really getting a chance to know somebody. You can make little comments there too, but it's not the same. Hmm. Um, TikTok is very much about self-promotion. So this is a great question. How, How do you, especially with it being such a crowded, loud Mm -hmm. uh, landscape, how do you cut through and how do you, this is key, make a real connection with another human. Right. Um, we are sel- We have not adapted uh, to the changes that have happened in the last 10, 15 years. Biologically speaking, there's no way on earth we could have evolved fast enough to be comfortable with the situation we all find ourselves in now. Yeah. So we, we try our best, but we're all floundering. We're all making a mess of it we're all having a hard time um i think holding on to our attention span right which is a crucial part of of building connections and building real relationships you know if you're if you're constantly distracted or looking for the next thing you're not even able to just listen to someone and absorb what they're saying and sure. then give them back something that is uh meaningful so uh, my advice would be to find a way to force there to be a slowdown or force there to be a moment of engagement that lasts for longer than 10 seconds, 30 seconds, or whatever it is. Um, and you have to manufacture that in, in very creative ways. So for example, if you're trying to build an audience um, and you want you want them to to care about what it is you're, you're selling or you're making or whatever it is that you have to, to tell them. Um, I think, you know, even though we're all sick of email, if you can find a way to get content to them that requires them to pause and take it in and get excited about it and want to either come back to you with a response that you could, that can then build a real conversation or, send it out to others who will then build a conversation around it, mm-hmm. um, then you're, you're on the right track. Yeah. I've seen some people use Twitter this way very effectively, and it's not easy to do. There's a guy named Sahil Lavinia, who's the founder of um, Gumroad, um, and he's a brilliant guy. And he really curates his tweets. He, <laughs> he's careful. He, he writes them with with a, there's they're always kind of open ended or they're they're always inviting discussion, um, and they or they at least invite people to stop and think about an idea, mm. and when he does that, uh, he is then kind of uh, causing people, I guess, to feel like there's an addiction to that content. They they're addicted to it because they want oh, what's he going to say next that I can think about and then I can maybe respond to and. Um, so he's taken that approach and it's, that's a really interesting way to use Twitter. It's, it's harder than it sounds. So, I mean, it sounds like what you're saying, Kyle, is that, uh, you know, for one quality over quantity, if you want to build real meaningful engagement with other human beings and create a following that is passionate about your work. And the other thing is, is that the digital lives inside the real, the digital world lives inside the real world. And yeah. to, you it, don't discount the, the, the value of a real world connection, even if it has to be through a potentially digital medium, like, you know, what, what we're doing right now, you know, have a zoom call with people, see their expression, hear the, 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 the timbre of their voice, understand all those points of communication, but if possible, you know, approach them and, and have, and have meaningful conversations, especially if you're trying to build a relationship that breaks you through in your career, not just 
a follower, yeah. a following. Um, yeah. Every meaningful uh, moment in my career path that leveled me up, took me to a new place that really opened doors, et cetera, came through real human connection to right. someone. And I can give you multiple examples of that, but um, it is absolutely harder now to yeah. do that. And of course, we're living through a global pandemic, which is really making it hard. But <laughs> making it more hard, yeah. If we could just for a moment set that aside and just <laughs> just to talk about it, because hopefully that'll that'll be less of an issue in, in two years or so. I'm, yeah. you know, we'll see. It, hopefully, it'll settle down a little. Um, but uh, I think I think it's. Yeah, you're, you said the digital lives inside the the real world. It is part of the real world, and it is really probably the dominant way we communicate. And that's that's really just the fact. I mean, we can't ignore that. Um, it's funny though because you said, you know, is my advice to uh, do quality over quantity? Well, um, there's a balancing act there. The frequency with which you reach out to your audience or give them something new to chew on can't be so infrequent that they you lose their their attention. Um, and it's a really hard balancing act. You can obviously overdo it. You can also burn yourself out and you can force yourself to lower the quality by trying to overproduce. So there's a lot there to, to, to balance. Um, and I had to work out that with the brush business that I created, those digital brushes for, for Photoshop, which um, I was trying to figure out what is the sort of, the cadence, you know, am I, am I sending people a, a weekly newsletter? Am I sending people something once a month? And what I realized was I would do, I would communicate differently through different platforms. So on Tumblr, you know, which now is probably people don't even bother with, I don't know, but at the mm -hmm. time I was lucky because Tumblr was this product was this dominant image based, you know, uh, mm -hmm. engine and I would post something on Tumblr almost daily because that was the expectation. Twitter, I would do just art examples of what I was doing with the brushes pretty much daily, but I wouldn't say anything promote, like promoting them, maybe except every other day. And it would be something very, you know, not in your face. Mm -hmm. Like, um, you like this drawing? I did this with this particular pencil. And by the way, you can get it here. And this is the period of your career where you were doing, where you had built the company Kyle Brushes. Yeah, I, I, and that all came out of it was all um, purely organic. I got really lucky. I was doing brushes since two thousand and three or four, whatever it was. Oh wow! So that overlapped heavily with your illustration. Your, yeah. Your, so your going freelance. back to the advertising agency, I, I said I'd get back to this, and so I think it's a good time to mention it. One of the ways I was able to work in a lot of different styles was I started learning the how to create Photoshop brushes with the Photoshop brush settings panel and the brush engine. Mm -hmm. And that just became a really, really fascinating thing for me. Like, how far can I push this to make things look like natural media, charcoal, paints, et cetera. Right. Um, and so I did that anyway. I was always doing that in the background and creating brushes for my own work. And if anyone goes to my portfolio, my website, which is sorely in need of an update, but you'll notice that I'm kind of a chameleon style wise. I don't stick with one particular look a lot of the time hmm. I bounce around that allowed me to do a lot of different kinds of work for different clients. And so that was one of the reasons I was able to have a career. I think that stretched for a good uh, 10 or 11 years, whatever it was when I was hundred percent freelance before I joined Adobe. Right. Um, anyway, towards the latter half of that, that career, the illustration chunk, uh, a friend of mine said, you should try and sell those. And because um, I was just lo loaning them out or loaning, I was giving them to friends all the time. Like here, try this brush, try that brush here, try these. Because <laughs> people would be like, hey, they knew I made brushes. And they like, do, do you have a brush that does this? Do you have a brush that does that? And I just send them around. And then this one guy suggested selling them. So I sold one one pack of 25 brushes like just for five bucks. I thought, oh, I'll just try it. And in the first week it made $2,000. And all I had done was post it on Twitter one time, hey, I made a brush pack. So I said, whoops, I better take this very seriously. And so I turned it into a legit business and it basically became my sole focus for, um, the, in the first year it was, it was I was very, very serious about it, but in the, the, the following three or four years, I, I went all in on it and um, turned it into really what, what I became known for. Yeah, and that became kind of your first taste of passive income, right? Making money while you sleep. 
It was, it, it was definitely, it was, that was the whole reason I did it was I, you know, having, we had just had our second child, uh, you know, a few years prior to that. And that was when I got into passive income stuff it was when our, when our second kid was born, I, um, made the iPhone game, mm-hmm. uh, which, which was successful. It got into the top, um, top five puzzle games in the, iPhone, in the app categories. And it was in the top 25 apps all overall for on Apple a, uh, app store. Oh yeah, on iTunes. Wow. Now on this iTunes, was back yeah. in two thousand nine, so um, back when it was called iTunes. <laughs> yeah, this was like, <laughs> and the, I was lucky because games were still pretty new. Yeah. So, and this is an example of like thinking differently. All the games were bright and colorful, so I made a black and white game. Smart. So I think that's why Apple featured it, and um, so with the, I, I invested two thousand dollars in that game uh, with this guy, uh, this wonderful developer in Ireland, Dennis Hennessy who I'm working on an app with right now, actually. Really? Um, uh, again, an example of somebody I've never met in person, but because we've seen each other's faces so many times and talked on the phone and talked on Skype or whatever, we are good friends, you know? And I think you need that that relationship. Yeah. You don't want to work with people you don't like. <laughs> yeah, I 100% agree with you yeah. on that. Um, but anyway, uh, that was my first taste of passive income. Because yeah. that $2,000 investment turned into $27,000 in sales. Um, over the span of about two months when it was, you know, still in the iTunes, you could find it on the homepage of the app store. Mm-hmm. Once it got off the homepage, sales just, you know, yeah. yeah. Um, so, but that got me excited. I was like, Hey, I don't have to like, just answer the phone and do jobs. I right. can make something and then try and make money from it. So I tried several other things. I tried more apps. Um, I tried, I think you may, maybe you know this or not. I made a graphic novel with a friend of mine. Um, which one was that tons of work it was called light children it, it took forever it was 90 pages full color oh you have a, you have a copy of that oh yeah <laughs> <laughs> I, I refuse to open it all the way because i don't want to crease the spine so, i'm, no, I'm, I'm gonna yeah. go ahead and put it right back in the plastic right now so much work <laughs> <laughs> that unfortunately I mean, it's a great story i was really i was really I, he he's an amazing storyteller and writer and oh thinker. it's such and a great we have book. another story we're trying to make right now but we're just but we're both just too busy but yeah um it's so cool. It's actually way better. His, he's he's got an amazing brain. I tried lots of things. <laughs> so I guess that's passive prints. income too, right? I mean, you had you had well, you had it the would brushes. Be if it made the, money. <laughs> so which one has been the most successful? It's brushes, right? I mean, oh yeah, the brushes uh, were crazy. It was like it was. I mean, I don't want to be crude about it, but it was basically like having an ATM in the house. If I, <laughs> if I was, if I said, "Oh, well, let's go on vacation," I'll release a new brush set. <laughs> and it just pop I, pop 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 pop. Yeah, which, but that, I mean, that was, and that was three or four years into the start of the business. By that point, I had almost a half a million subscribers. Mm. Um, in what to channel? My, uh, what's that? In what channel? Yeah, subscribers, I say it's, I mean, to my, to my Gumroad uh, products page. Gumroad is a place where you can make any digital product and sell it. Oh, okay. Um, Interesting. It's phenomenal. It's amazing. Everyone should, if you have something digital you want to sell, absolutely use Gumroad. Okay. Um, the cool thing about it is they, for no matter how many subscribers you have, mm-hmm. they're not going to charge you extra for for a mailing list and for sending emails. Okay. And you're and you have a product page, and they take PayPal, and they they only take like what is it ten percent of your sale or something? Mm-hmm. It is the best platform for creative professionals. Interesting. Ever. Interesting. Yeah, it's an absolute. Yeah, it's a, now are they are, are they um are they working with NFTs now? No, they're not. They're not. But you you have you have your your eye on NFTs. You understand sort of yeah, the value yeah. and how and I'll explain and link to some just that in my description if any of the creators out there don't know what NFTs are. It's fascinating to say the least. I mean, just super fascinating uh, way for for, for yeah. digital creators to be able to maintain ownership and and monetize their digital creations forever. Yeah, it's fantastic uh, fantastic idea with the potential to really help digital artists finally right. not, I mean, I don't want to say get respect, but, but really a lot of it has to do with like you, the work you create should have real value. And, um, you know, just because there's no artifact, uh, doesn't mean it's not real art and right. there should be a way to, to own that art. So yeah. I think they're solving that problem. It's an interesting way to solve it. And I'm excited about it. I think it's got, it's going to be probably a huge thing in another couple of years. I think it'll be, well worked out okay. as a system it well, might also become one of those issues where you have a lot of 
pay to play and a lot of gatekeeping, which mm-hmm. is what they're trying to avoid in the first place. But we'll see if it if it how democratized it is. Well, if there um, if I ever get a panel together to discuss blockchain and NFT, you're going to be on it, and I'm sure. inviting you. I want to I want to hear your point of view because that is really a fresh perspective that I haven't heard. Everyone's clamoring for it and interested in it from a you know, authorship perspective and a monetization perspective. No one's talked about those potential concerns and downsides. And I'm just fascinated. I just threw that out you at you uh, randomly. And I wasn't even sure if you were, uh, if you were, you know, hip to the blockchain, man. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I work for a Silicon Valley company, so I have That's to kind of know what's That's going true. on with some stuff. Let's talk about that, man. I mean, so you work for Adobe. What's your title at Adobe right now? Oh, don't laugh. My my actual tire title is I am the senior design evangelist for Adobe. Um, I know the word evangelist is a is a it obviously throws people off a lot. Uh, they're thinking about it in religious context, um, but really uh, it started with a guy named Russell Brown. Um, I don't know twenty years ago, or whatever. At Adobe, the, the point of it was how do you get out there and educate the creative community on. Mm-hmm best practices for whatever your area is, photography, design, illustration, et cetera. Um, so it's kind of like a combination of art education and, and education for apps. Like, are you trying to do this specific thing in Photoshop? Let mm. me show you the three fastest ways to do it. Okay. Are you trying to do this in Illustrator? I'm going to show you. And what they would do is the evangelist and team would go actually like all year round, all around the world, flying from site to site to site, and having these huge events where people like hundreds of creative people would come, designers, mm-hmm. photographers, et cetera. And they would do demos of the products and then answer questions. And it was really cool. And then that a lot of that process moved online with Adobe Live, which mm-hmm. is now what I participate in. I do like three or four shows a week mm-hmm. where I do uh, think I talk about brushes, talk about illustration, talk about design, I talk about using Photoshop, and I talk about using Adobe Fresco, uh, which is one of the apps that I was um Help, I helped to uh, build and I, my, my part was small and big at the same time. I made all the brushes for it, which of course is important because it's a painting, and it's a drawing and painting app. It's an illustration app, so you have to have brushes. Mm. But that was my contribution apart from like comments about features and things like that. It's a huge team of incredible people um, well, who when did you obviously s- all the busy work, but... When, when you say it's a small piece, I went out and actually looked at the Adobe uh, Creative Cloud channel, and it's divided, obviously, into all these different playlists. Um, and the one that you participate in, it has the most content of all of them, from what I can <laughs> tell. So it looks like you play a larger role than than, than you uh, you make out. Well, people love to draw. And um, we have two apps, three apps, actually, that you know, people, it's funny because Adobe Illustrator, sometimes people get confused about what that is. Um, I always thought Adobe Illustrator should be called Adobe Shape Builder because it's, it's illustration app, but most people don't use it like with freehand drawing. They they use the pen tool, which is a tool that allows you to build and create shapes, and then you can fill them with textures and gradients and patterns and solid colors and so on. And it's a, it's a vector-based drawing app. So vector art is infinitely scalable. Right. Raster art is pixel-based. Right. Photoshop and Fresco are more geared towards people who want to draw and paint in a more traditional sense. Mm-hmm. They want to have brushes that feel like oils and watercolors and pencils and so on. Um, and so we that's really where I spend my time is, is helping people get comfortable with and really enjoy and make their best work in Fresco and in Photoshop. Wow. So Fresco's on iPad, a bunch of Windows devices and iPhone. Okay. It's a free app, uh, which a lot of people I think are very confused about. Um, everyone thinks Adobe is pay to play no matter what. There's actually like dozens of free stuff that we make. Fresco, free apps. Adobe Fresco is free? Totally free. Oh, it, there wow. are, And there are several apps we have like this that are totally free. There's also a paid option, uh-huh. but the free version of Fresco is 100% like uh, pro app, fully functional. You're not getting re- restricted in any way. It has unlimited layers, 8K documents, um, over a hundred brushes and- Your brushes? They're all mine, yeah. All of yours. Wait, so... Fre- they're, they're, they're my brushes. I made them for Fresco. Right. If you want the full library, which I think is close to 2,000 brushes that Adobe acquired in 2017, and I make new ones every quarter, um, that is part of the subscription. You so, made 2,000 brushes, Kyle? Yeah, and I know them all, every one by name. They're like little babies. You're <laughs> joking. That's incredible. Oh, my God. Okay, that's that's just... Well, that came out of the, that brush business. At the, at the time I sold it, I had about 1,700, 1,800 brushes, something did, like that. I don't know. Did Adobe come to you, or did you take them to Adobe? Did you already have relationships? I mean, how did that 
transpire. So yeah, something like that is such a complicated thing, but you do have to have a goal, you know, and I think it's kind of like, I'm sure people have talked about this before, the idea of having long-term goals and short-term goals and making those short-term goals more achievable on your way to the long-term goal so that the long-term goal isn't so intimidating and so far away that you just kind of give up or get scared of even trying to like figure out how to get there. So short-term goals for me were get the brushes in the hands of artists who are working for the biggest animation studios and things like that. That it does. That's not really such a heavy lift because I'm already plugged into Twitter and I know artists through illustration community who know artists. So what I would do is send them for free to friends of mine who would know people, for example, at DreamWorks and Disney and Pixar, right? And I'd say, hey, if you like these, send them to a friend in one of those studios, which they would do. And then I would say, hey, get me that email address of that person. And they'd be like, no problem. And then I would email that person a month or so later and say, uh, a friend of mine sent you some of my brushes. Wonder if you had a chance to use them. Email come back. Oh my God, they're awesome. I'm, I'm having so much fun. I'd be like, oh, cool, cool, cool. Hey, who's your studio manager there? I'm really curious to know if it'd be possible for me to do a licensing deal for your whole art department. Interesting. And they'd be like, oh, okay. They'd give me the email address for a studio manager. So then I'd contact the studio manager for somebody at Pixar or Disney or whatever and be like, I've got these brushes. Your artists are really, really digging them. Mm-hmm. It's cool that they're all passing them around. But honestly, if you want to do this deal properly, if you want to like own them legit, it is a business. I did create these. I'm happy that they're using them, but we should work out a licensing deal. So they'd be like, yeah, sure. Okay. What, what kind of deals do you have? And then I would have a price breakdown for you can install them on 10 computers or 20 or 30 or whatever. Right. And then I could legitimately say after that deal was done to a company like Adobe, Hey, Adobe, um, Disney artists, Pixar artists, DreamWorks artists, et cetera, you know, Weta Digital, these artists all have official licensing deals with me to use these artists, uh, to use these brushes in your app in Photoshop. Mm-hmm. Wouldn't it be cool if they were just already part of Photoshop? Wouldn't that make people happy? That was going to be my, my business plan. And so it, I thought that was going to be how it worked, but it's not that simple. So what I did instead was that was, that was always the goal. But then what I started doing was connect, connecting with Adobe designers because they have a huge design team. So sure. reach out to a designer and be like, are you familiar with my brushes? I know you would probably like to draw. Give them a try and just send them to them. These are cool. And I'd say, yeah, I'm also an illustrator. I noticed that you have guests on every now and then on Adobe, your Adobe live channel. I'd love to do a live stream sometime. So, okay, yeah, we'll do that. And then we get a live stream. So then I'm connecting with those people. And so it's that it's that building a network and building a team around your idea without those other people necessarily realizing they're becoming a part of your big plan to get to what it is you're really trying to achieve. Um, and again, this is not like a, a sneaky thing. This is a, what you're doing is you're, you're building the support so that when the, the moment finally arrives where you're trying to do the big deal, you have all these people who are like, oh yeah, that makes perfect sense. As opposed to, well, hold on a second. That's, yeah. Let's like slow down a, there, buddy. You're not even a known entity. You just right. come out of nowhere. Like, Do you see what I mean by this guy being a genius? I mean, the, the creative <laughs> genius, the business acumen, every piece of this just just comes together in such a, uh, an effective way. And, and you just fascinate me. And I, as well as I know you, I feel like I don't know half of you. Because <laughs> when I ask these kind of questions, it's so cool. So you, Well, uh, that's what eventually happened. But it took a long time. It was like three or four year process. Wow. So, and, and so it just developed or um, pseudo organically through your proactive networking through this whole universe of designers and creators and studios and studio managers. And then, then what they, they said, Hey, Kyle, we got a deal. So for you, then, the, so again, like with small steps, they had an app called Adobe sketch, which was on the iPad. It was one of the first iPad drawing apps. Um, and when the Apple pencil came out, which I think was 2015, something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, the Apple Pencil came out and changed everything because then you could have like actual pressure recognition when you drew. So in Sketch, um, you know, they had some some built-in brushes which were quite nice. And I approached a designer I knew who was at Adobe um, and said, uh, "Hey, um, long shot, but I would love, love, love." to do some kind of an exclusive deal with you guys where you just put like five of my brushes in sketch. And 
I said, and at the time I approached him about this idea, I already was the best known brush creator in the world. So I could say to him with some confidence, you know, people know my brushes. I think this would help people like with sketch be like, Oh, I want to do sketch. It's got some brushes and sketch was free. Hmm. So free app, exclusive brushes. It's a cool deal. Um, and so we did that and it actually happened, which was my first kind of like success, like working with Adobe where I had a business deal and that then got me thinking, okay, I'm this much closer now to that, that, that goal I have, I need to really make this work. So I, I really hammered on making a few more brush sets that I knew would be big successes, um, by listening to the customer, you know, always had my feelers out saying, what is it you want? What do you all want to draw? What do you, uh, what do you need? And people were like concept brushes, concept brushes, concept brushes. They wanted brushes that sped up the process of doing concept art. So like brushes that make uh, leaves, brushes that make fur, brushes uh, that make rain, brushes that you can just quickly get an idea down, like especially people with video game and, and concept art for, for films and animation and so on. Um, so that was one of the brush sets I released and then so a few others. And, but, and then when my, when my mailing list got up to that half a million mark, I said, all right, I've got half a million customers. I know my brushes are being downloaded to the tune of about a thousand units per day illegally on Pirate Bay. So that's a huge sign of success. And I could use those numbers because, I mean, it was obviously made me angry because I was losing tons of money, but, but I could then, I, so I took all my data for sales, piracy, you know, retweets on my stuff, blah, 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 follower count, took it all. And I got a business manager because I don't know how to do these things, but I, I got a business manager. And again, this is using a network. I, I reached out to friends of mine who I knew had done good licensing deals as illustrators. And one guy who had done a deal with the Mo with Museum of Modern Art in New York, this guy, James Yang, said, hey, my agent's really good at this stuff. And I called him and told him what I was trying to accomplish. And like, I, it sounded like such a crazy thing, but he totally was like, I think we can do this. And he said, I know a lawyer and I know a guy who does valuations on businesses. Like this is what your business is worth based on your numbers. Right. right. And so the three of us basically got together, you know, virtually and worked out a proposal that we sent to a design director at Adobe who I knew was connected to or plugged into some of the executives on the creative cloud side. And, um, it sat there. I didn't hear anything for, I guess, three months. Oh. So I thought, oh, well, that's just gone. Yeah. And then I got this email one day where they said, uh, Hey, um, let's have a, a call. We want to talk more about this. And when I got, when we had a call, there were these two corporate lawyers on the phone, as well as this, uh, VP over there. And they started to lay out what they thought would need to happen next, which was for me to do a proper, a proper proposal. What we had sent the first time was kind of like a rough draft, I guess, in, in their eyes. I see. So really work out a proper proposal and then they would come back with something. Okay. And we did that. And so, um, cool. Yeah. Well, I won't, day, I won't, uh, <laughs> I won't pry on, on, on the numbers, but I assume that, uh, you're, you're a happy camper. It was a, it was a fair, the, the amount of money I got was was basically the way I worked it out was I thought what would be the what would be the equivalent uh, of the, like the amount of money I would get take home not like pre uh, post tax mm -hmm. how much money would I make if I continued to sell the brushes at the rate that I was selling them and and continue to build my audience mm -hmm. over the next four years that four was years. my sort of number that I came up okay. with and so that was the number we went out with them to and they accepted it. There was no negotiation. They accepted it, but there was, but the one term, which was, and then of course, when they accepted it right away, I was like, Oh man, I could have asked for more. Yeah. So of course <laughs> I know <laughs> always go big. Um, yeah. And I, and I did have a bigger number in mind, but I, I just talking to my manager too, both of us were like, you know, you, the last thing we want to do is come in there looking greedy or looking like we unrealistic about what we sure, think the real value sure. of this is. Um, and, and the rig, the biggest value really, I think to Adobe was me coming on board to work there. Um, not to make myself sound important, but 
more than the the, the products themselves. Mm-hmm. Um, having the person who created them come work for you makes more sense. And so, as part of our deal, uh, the financial part of it, there was the financial part. There was also a, a, a they call it an aqua hire, like an acquisition with a hiring. And I was also hire. hired. I love that. Yeah. Okay. So, and I came in on the design team and then I moved to the uh, community team, which is where I work now, which okay. is the um, Adobe Live evangelism team. And that's where you so, are an active contributor into the Adobe Creative Cloud uh, YouTube channel and I assume other social channels. Is that right? Yeah, I, I work, I'm, 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 I have a really wonderful job. I'm really lucky because what I get to do is I get to float. So I have my main responsibilities for Adobe Live, where I do shows and I and I'm a you know I'm always doing um, events where I'm educating people. I work with universities, you know I'll I'll, I'll also work with K through twelve, but uh, I also I also get to consult uh, teams on anything brush related or anything illustration related. So I get to bounce around Adobe Arrow. Uh, I've, I've talked to folks over there. I've talked to folks. Of course, with Photoshop team a lot, Fresco, um, new new stuff I can't talk about, but new stuff that's in the works. Um, before when we when we acquired Substance, which I don't know if you know about Substance, mm-hmm. but it's the biggest um, asset generation uh, software for um, like three D textures and and things like that for films and games and mm-hmm. and 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 just creating three D environments. It's a pretty amazing suite of products. Uh, I think we acquired them. Not like maybe eight, 10 months ago, something like that, maybe a year ago. Mm-hmm. Prior to that, I was talking to them about some brush stuff. And so I really get, I really get to just sort of get my fingers in a lot of different pies. And it's so fun um, because every, every week for me is different. So that's kind of exciting. So I imagine another advantage to working for Adobe is having almost unlimited access to resources, people, uh, you know, digital artifacts, other kinds of software, yeah. things, think beta stuff and knowing what's coming around the corner and the connections. Is there, can you talk to us a little bit about some of the, the, um, the reasons yeah. you decided to, 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 to sign the aqua hire and actually, instead of just selling your brushes and going on to do the next thing, actually, you know, committing your time, your personal energy into Adobe. Yeah, because, um, this gives me the opportunity that joining Adobe gave me the opportunity to actually be part of the process of creating the tools that artists make, not just um, me having to create like what is essentially, I guess, a plugin. You say it's not really a plugin, but instead of having to work within the boundaries of what was already created, I would get to expand those boundaries. I would get to come in and start helping with the products themselves from the ground up and say, and especially a product like Adobe Fresco, which when I joined the team didn't even exist yet. It was, there was a, (laughs) I came in at the best time because I came in right when they were having the planning meeting for like the roadmap for Adobe Fresco as a product. Um, What I get to do is sort of pie in the sky, dream up, what is it that artists want? And then communicate that to the product manager and to the engineers Mm -hmm. and then see if we can make it. So the cool thing is you said resources, I mean, Dude, the scientists at Adobe, I didn't even know they had a science, to, like this, this group of scientists. Like physics? Oh, yeah. Like all this, they do everything. They just, they have, talk about a cool job. They get to sit and just kind of play by making, they make prototypes, like just day in and day out of, here's this thing that you can do. Here's this thing you can do. And then if one of those prototypes is seems especially practical, right? Then can we then take the prototype and put it into an app? So an example of that is in Fresco, you have watercolors and oils that stay wet. And the watercolors, if you haven't tried Fresco, you you put a little color down, you can see the paint move and then it settles. And then you grab another color and like paint into it and it all blends and and it's wet. And that came out of a prototype that was sitting there with one of the scientists, uh, Byung Moon, um, and we, we, you know, that got baked into fresco and then the oils too. this guy, Gili had done this incredible work with, with the height of the paint and the lighting on it and the, the, you know, and so the oil paints mix and, and have height and depth like physical media. Mm. Um, 
And so that also got based. So it's like things, things that come out of the, that department can make it into an app. I would have no, no access to that if I were outside the company, but being part of the company, I could, in fact, I even sat with Gili with some actual water, I mean, with Young Moon with some watercolors, you know, back when we were developing this three years ago. And I was like, look, you know, and I'd paint and say, can we do that? <laughs> this is what real paint does, you know, make yeah. it spread more and make, you know, that kind of, what an amazing opportunity. So that's the exciting thing is I, anything that the illustration community can think of yeah. gets communicated to me, then I can communicate it to Adobe and we can try and make it happen. I saw an article about a uh, reconstruction of an Edvard Monk brush. Was that something that Adobe brought to you or is that something that... Yeah. It, so that was another sort of... That was incredible. Um, that was right before I got hired. Um, so the Edvard Monk Museum... Um, if you don't know Edward Monk, people out there, he's the artist who did the scream, the painting of the guy going, ah, <laughs> on a bridge. And it's a expression is like, uh, yeah, expressionism piece. Um, anyway, um, basically it was the hundredth anniversary of that painting and they wanted, they actually had his, actually, they had his brushes at the museum in a, in a vault down in the basement and they sent me. High resolution photographs are like these 8,000 pixel square wow. images that were scans of the, the bristles of his of four, four or five of his different brushes that he used. I recreated them digitally. Um, and then we gave them away. It was just, like, they were free brushes people could download. Wow. And there was a contest too, where people did their own version of the screen. Wow. So any modern interpretation, any stylistic interpretation you wanted. And then the top prize for that, I think was you got to fly out to the museum see the original painting of which I think there are three versions of it. Um, he, there was a big cash prize. I think it was like 5,000 Euro or something, some other things. Um, and I got to go out to Sweden in Stockholm, even though the museum's in Norway. I, and that's where I, I filmed a little promo for it and stuff. Got to see Stockholm, which I've never seen beautiful city. Um, and just had a, such a good time with that. What a, what a great, that was such an amazing opportunity. And experience. Adobe brought that to you somehow. Is that that happened because I was the 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 known brush guy? I see. So by that point, I had built up this reputation. If there was something brush related, wow. Uh, oh, Kyle should do that thing. So yeah, of course. Um, it just was such a great opportunity. So, and that goes back to what I was saying earlier about having goals. Like I did have a goal as well to become the best known brush maker. I see. And it, it's kind of like a thing that didn't exist anyway. Mm -hmm. People had made Photoshop brushes, but nobody was out there going like, I'm the brush person. Sure. So I decided to become that person. Become the brush person. I was going to ask you sort of what you, you know, you would like to be known for right now. I mean, maybe not like mm -hmm. for the rest of your life, but it, you, you, you answered the question already. You know, you, you set a long-term goal to, to, to have a niche, to have a specialty, to be the best mm -hmm. at something. And, and yeah. it's very specific. It's a very specific thing. And, yeah. and you worked your way to achieve that goal, you know, incrementally and through an organic networking process, which is. Yeah, there are different ways to go about it. So you can, you can either try and do something that appeals to everybody. Right. Or you can single out a very specific group of people who you know, like the back of your hand because you're part of that group. Right. And then you can make something for them. And so what's your advice? And that's on what that? I did. What's your advice? I mean, do you think that in terms of niche, I mean, there's a lot of people do mass appeal content, right? T yeah. TikTok yeah. is full of it. Yeah. My thumb hurts now just thinking about <laughs> it. <laughs> um, you don't do mass appeal content. I mean, you, you do, you do stuff for specifically for designers or illustrators or brush fanatics or fine yeah. artists. But, you know, you've even kind of narrowed in even further than that. Do you, I mean, do you have kind of disdain for mass appeal content or do you ever see yourself sort of maybe participating in mass appeal content? Or do you think that, you know, you will always um, kind of stay in this niche or a niche? Well, I, I, I think it's so hard to create something that appeals to the general public. Um, because I, first of all, um, that's a, that's a space where everyone's trying to get their attention. Right. Crowded. So everyone's trying to get everyone's attention. Um, but when it comes to this, this small group of people that I know so well, because I'm one of them, mm -hmm. well, I can read their minds basically. I see. 
because I can read my own mind. Right. When I want something and it doesn't exist, I can either complain about it or I can try and make it. You know, yep. and if I know that I want it, I know that these members of my community want it too. The good news is that community, as small as it is, because it's now, you know, we have global reach. Mm -hmm. So for if I were making the brushes pre-internet, how would I have gotten them out to people? Well, I, it would have been like local designers and, and people in ad agencies and stuff like, like that CDs. in my immediate area. Yes, yeah, CDs. <laughs> uh, you know, so I would say the community here is small. There are maybe like three or 400 people in Winston-Salem mm -hmm. who would have any interest in what I'm doing. So right. that would have been the end of the business, basically. Right, right. Unless I wanted to invest a ton of money, yeah, which I didn't have. But for the low, low price of zero dollars, well, you know, internet connection mm -hmm. uh, and, a, and a Photoshop uh, subscription, I was able to create brushes and sell them to the entire world. Yeah. Now the community gets a lot bigger. So <clears throat> no matter how small the group is, it's still global now. So yeah. you, yeah, I, I, I go that way. Yeah. Now, it seems like that's don't. a smart move. I mean, it seems like the formula that, that, that I've seen a lot of successful people do is, is develop a specialty, get really mm -hmm. good at something, understand that niche, that market, that those people who care about the thing that you've now specialized in get to a point where you've leveraged social media and your ability to sort of work with them and, and communicate and engage with them. But even if that's a small market, even if there's a cap on that market, like maybe there's only, you know, 50,000 people in the world who care about this. That's a, you know, a lot of people look at that and say, well, oh, 50,000 people, how am I going to monetize 50,000 people? That's not the way to look at it. Take it further. That's a huge audience. Take It's a huge audience. And especially yeah. if they, if you are a beloved member of a smaller audience, because now you are known for that. You can, um, you can develop some of this, this passive income stream, digital content, NFT type work uh, yeah. in that. And now you have a, a, a fiercely loyal audience that is willing to consume that and share that and pay for it for, you know, their, yeah. their purposes. And you have to just, you have to treat that audience like gold and right. you'd be in good shape. I, I gave away more brushes than I sold. <laughs> I didn't realize and that. And I still made just now. seven figures yeah. selling brushes before I even, wow. before I even sold the business to Adobe. Incredible. Um, I know that's a little crude to talk about, but it's the truth. Oh, I, people want to know. I, I mean, people are trying. I think it's there. important. People should know that that's how big it is yeah. when you have a global audience. That's, it's incredible. Yeah. Like. Never in a million years that I think it would get that successful. Yeah. But when you when you do have global reach, you suddenly realize there are always kids who are picking up a stylus for the first time mm. all over the world, wondering how do I get better at this or what tools can I use? If the first thing they think of is, oh, I saw that guy Kyle's stuff on, someone was talking about it on Reddit, then you're good to go. But the, the trick is to treat your customers like, like gold. So I gave away more brushes than I sold wow. by... By the millions, um, because I knew that that would lead to sales. You know, I don't know what the conversion rate was, but yeah, um, whatever it was was good enough to to keep the business going. So that's awesome. That's incredible, and it looks like they don't seem Adobe doesn't seem to have a a, a problem with you cross promoting the, the the Adobe Live content onto your channels and building your your continuing to build your audience because that is your audience that you brought to them oh so what i do yeah so my own my own channel um i've, I've been doing photoshop tips mm -hmm. and i think i've uploaded a few of the shows i've done if i think they're relevant mm -hmm. um to my general audience uh and no there's no conflict there unless Good. i was trying to sell something of my own right um for example with the brushes i don't sell my own brushes anymore instead what i do is fundraisers and i did those before i i sold the business but i did more of them since i sold it um, just because there's been so much bad stuff happening in the last yeah. few years. So, um, so what I do is I set it up to where I'll create a small brush set or a brush and then, um, people can pay for it. And then I have a, whatever charity or group that I then donate all the proceeds to. And here's the best part. Adobe will match that. Wow. <laughs> That's, that is I know, so cool. like they're so awesome. Wow. Yeah. So, um, India COVID relief we did, yeah. Australia wildfires, wow. Black Lives Matter. Um, we've done brush fundraisers, maybe like five or six in the last three years that have been really, really, really great. Do you have and, an idea um, how much you've made or raised for the for these causes? 
Um, each one was usually somewhere between five and ten thousand dollars on my side, and then Adobe would match it. So I guess uh, maybe a hundred thousand dollars worth of. That's great. I don't know, which is great. Yeah, of our, course. As an individual, I could never, never make a. I can't. You know, it. That's an insane thing that I. But that's the great thing. I still have that mailing list, although it's great dwindled now incredibly because I'm not sure those people know that I'm not giving them right. a bunch of brushes anymore. I have a few freebies that I just leave up on the site if people want them. Um, but uh, I think my mailing list now is down to like two, 230, 230,000. Okay. Which is still a lot of people, but nowhere near. It's like less than half what it was. Interesting. So what's next in the, uh, in the book of Kyle Webster? What's the next chapter of your life look like? I don't know, man. I, I, um, I love doing what I'm doing now. I'm very happy with the work I'm doing because it does, like I said earlier, have some kind I'm, I'm basically getting to have an impact on what digital artists get to do, uh, much more so than I did before. And since that's the world I live in, it's cool to be able to sort of shape that in some way. Mm. Um, so I like that. I have a, a new agent for picture book work, um, Chad Beckerman, and I'm hoping to get something done with him soon. Um, obviously I'm very busy, but uh, a couple of ideas I sent him that I think are decent and we're, we're working on those. Um, I did a picture book three, four years ago, which I was, that was such a great experience and I want to do more of that. It was with Scholastic. Um, I saw that. Please, please say please. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. And I was, I just want to do more of that. Um, working on an app right now based on a book that I, I made two years ago called um, Trace. So Trace is, was published through Baron Fig, which is B-A-R-O-N, Fig. They're a company in New York. They publish like uh, tools for creators, for creative thinkers, basically. Notepads and pens, like really good pens, um, things like that. And they had these, these special edition notebooks. And mine was about meditation mm -hmm. through drawing. And um, I'm actually doing an app now as a follow-up to that called Lines of Zen, which is a, a meditation app that will uh, hopefully be really different and um, make some waves. So wow. I'm working on that with Dennis, that guy in Ireland who I told you about. Hennessy. Dennis Hennessy. Yeah. <laughs> That's an easy name to remember for some reason. I love it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, it is a good name. <laughs> I, uh, I wish you all the best with, with your, with your endeavors with, I can't wait to see the new uh, children's picture book that comes out. I, I the app I'm, guaranteed to download and check it out <laughs> says i'll be happy to be a beta user give it oh i'll send it to you then absolutely absolutely man and i thank you for your time i'm always honored to to talk to you and to to pick your brain if uh, <laughs> if anyone out there wants to hear more of this guy you just let me know and we'll see if we can get a part two after uh after <laughs> after some of these super top secret projects are revealed to the public and and, and you have some, uh, some new stuff you would like to share. Thank you so much, Aaron. You know, I love you and I'm just glad, glad to see your face and this is so fun. So we should just it's really do, cool that you had me on. Thanks buddy. We should just do this for fun anyway. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, man. Well, thanks for coming on buddy and we'll talk soon. All right. All right. Bye. Bye.